Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to SQL and storage considerations for SharePoint 2010. Ooh, SharePoint 2010, really cool stuff. And you're probably asking yourself, what's different about SharePoint 2010 and SQL? Today, we're going to cover what's different, how it's different, and why it's important. So my name is Mike Watson. I'm a product manager at Quest Software. And uh, I've done my own branding here today. Uh, I'm the SharePoint mad scientist. A little bit about me. So I'm currently work at Quest. Uh, Quest is a uh, software vendor uh, who does, among other things, builds products for uh, improving availability, recoverability, manageability of um, different products, Microsoft Stack, Oracle Stack, things like that. Uh, we have a uh, SharePoint business there. It's uh, very robust, and I work within that business. Uh, Worked at Microsoft. This is where I got most of my relevant SQL experience because I worked on some very, very high-scale projects that made SQL very, very important. Um, helped uh, engineer and launch the, the BPOS dedicated standard. Everybody heard of this stuff? A few of you? Yeah, cool stuff. And uh, I worked at the uh, Center of Excellence um, for SharePoint and for uh, SQL. So I learned a bit about that. And uh, also for the SharePoint CAT team, which is customer advisory team. For that, this is the U.S. Army. That's rubbish. Whatever. You can find me and my latest ramblings at these various places, although I haven't done much blog work lately. Uh, you will find me on Twitter a little bit. So if you're here, um, hopefully you realize the importance of SQL. Hopefully you realize the importance of storage. If you don't, hopefully I can sway you to consider these things as very, very important. So important, in fact, that I can almost guarantee you, if you don't build SQL right, if you don't put considerations in storage and build it right, you will have problems in your environment. Be that a small environment, all virtual, or large-scale environment. It's very, very important. Why is it important? Well, it's a very interesting relationship where SQL is the basis, the platform, if you will, for pretty much all SharePoint componentry. And when SQL gets slow, SharePoint gets slow. And vice versa. If SharePoint gets slow, SQL will get slow. You don't want to create this vicious circle of bad performance and bad problems. And it's not just about performance, really. It's health issues arise if you don't have the adequate capacity and stuff on the back end to meet SharePoint's demands. So. Over the years, we've seen SQL rise in importance. We've seen, now I say SQL, I'm generally referring to SQL and in the storage subcomponents. Um, we've seen this rise in importance over the years. In 2001, we had no SQL going on. And we get to 2003, we had minimal SQL footprint. 2007, we started seeing SQL get more important. 2007, we had scalable services. Nothing scalable about them. Things like uh, search. Profiles, stuff like that. They all hit the database, all hit the back end, and uh, a lot of us started realizing performance issues because of that. We started seeing bottlenecks. This is where the first bottleneck started appearing. Some other cool stuff that was happening, uh, virtualization started to come into play in the 2007 uh, time frame. And we started seeing virtualization become more and more important. And the first guidance we started issuing at Microsoft was, don't virtualize SQL. Now here is 2010. In 2010, a lot of things have changed. But the importance, the reliance on SQL has grown greatly. We've also seen virtualization become mainstream. A lot of you use virtualized platforms via it, ESX, Hyper-V, Citrix, etc. You use these platforms, you expect them to work, and you'll run into various problems because of that. We've seen services grow. Let me get to a better slide on that. Oh, I don't have that right. Well, services. So in 2010, we have a number of new things that we didn't have in 2007. And just as, you know, 2001, we essentially have a file share in the sky. And then as we've grown, we've got more and more capability. 2010, we have a lot of capability. So a lot of you are asking, you know, why do I care and, and, and why is SQL and storage actually important? You know, how is this manifest into day-to-day -day problems? Well, I can guarantee you most of you have seen random 
SQL slowdowns. And they manifest themselves as just random uh, either site performance issues, uh, rendering list, rendering sites, especially you folks that use top-down um, site taxonomies. These things become uh, very, very slow. They're very, very dependent on SQL performance. And if SQL isn't tuned perfectly for that, they won't, uh, SharePoint will not perform very well. You also see randomness. Um, most of the times, you just have inexplicable problems. It's like, why is SharePoint slow? And you go and you look at your web servers. Web servers look fine. CPU's fine. Memory's fine. Um, disk I.O. and those, those machines are fine. And you just don't really have anything to point to as a problem. Quite difficult for troubleshooting. It also manifests itself as a problem because of flexibility. A lot of you will not have the flexibility if you haven't built uh, SQL in, in storage properly to do things like maintain your environment, back it up, recover it, run upgrades. One of the fastest ways you can upgrade your environment, and a lot of folks are probably considering this right now, is to spin up multiple SQL instances because you want as much database capacity as possible to run all those upgrade jobs. So you lose a lot of flexibility if you don't have adequate SQL in storage. So what's new for SQL and storage in SharePoint 2010? Well, first of all, and I won't drill in this anymore, but we just have specific SQL requirements now. SQL 2000, 2000 anybody use SQL 2000? Anybody? Bueller, Bueller? I want you to raise your hands, because you guys, you make my job at Quest a nightmare. So I gotta build support for these things, right? And I gotta build products that that use SharePoint, that work with SharePoint, and because SharePoint supports 2000 and everybody still owns 2000, I can't move my products forward, and so I have to have all this backwards compatibility stuff, which is difficult. I'd love for you guys to upgrade. Now you have a reason to upgrade. SharePoint won't support you anymore in 2010. There's another big thing, 64-bit only. Microsoft, not only on the front end, has decided that 64-bit is so important for performance, proper performance scalability that they decided to make the back end 64-bit only. And you'll actually see this. I thought maybe I could get away with uh, installing uh, SharePoint on a 32-bit SQL server. No, it won't let you. You can't put any of your databases there. They'll tell you it's not compatible. So it's very, very interesting. Uh, specific requirements in versioning. So if you're using 2005, and I'd highly encourage you to use 2008, for reasons I won't go in here today. Um, you need SP3 Alpha, uh, Cumulative Update 1, and if you're on 2008, you need SP1, Cumulative Update 2, to support SharePoint. So that's all I'll say about that. Where's my bullet? Where's my bullet? We might have machine slowness here. And if I had a proper SQL Server backing this up, <laughs> this would actually be performing properly. Oh, I'm locked up. Interesting. This random lockup performance. This is exactly what SharePoint performance issues look like when SQL becomes bogged down. And I am literally there. It goes. Ooh, don't hit the bad button. There we go. So. In SharePoint 2010, we have more SQL touch points. There's more reliance on SQL than ever before. We have this new stuff called service applications. I'll go into it in a bit. Service applications uh, are pretty much uh, a new way to do business in SharePoint that replace the shared service provider. They're important from SQL standpoint because not only do they contain uh, high-scale applications, applications that require lots of performance and robustness, uh, they also um, allow the persons who create service applications, not only at Microsoft, but your third parties who can create service applications. And Andrew Woody is doing a, a uh, session right now over at the dev session about creating custom service applications. There's a lot of reasons you can do it because it's a nice framework. Um, you get the, the ability to create one or more databases. And as a result, you end up with a lot more SQL touch points than you used to. You got better flexibility now in SharePoint 2010. Uh, there's a better model because of these new service, because of the service application model, uh, you have the ability to scale out now better than you used to. Uh, you got RBS possibilities. We'll talk about that in a minute, what that means. That's not Royal Bank of Scotland. Uh, and higher capacity guidance too. 
You got better availability, native support for DBmirroring we'll go into, and then better monitoring and control, um, specifically on the front end you know, around throttling, health analyzer. We'll actually look at some of this stuff today. So in SharePoint 2007, and I think even in 2003, we kind of had this mentality of proper topologies. And if you had specific scenarios, you would implement one of these topologies or use this topology as kind of a reference architecture for implementing your own design. And if, hopefully, the only reason you ever use this one, single server, was for you know, minor demo purposes, your own demo purposes, uh, consulting, uh, development work, things like that. When you got real, you stepped up to a small farm environment, which gave you, you know, two uh, app WFE servers and SQL. And then when you had your proper enterprises that had high scale needs, you know, 100,000 users plus, and they stepped up to multiple front ends, multiple app servers, and SQL. And they often had dedicated reasons for that. Enter 2010. What Microsoft's done now in 2010 is they removed the kind of the idea. These topologies are still valid for, for certain reasons, but what Microsoft wanted to do was get away from any uh, preconceived notions about what the scale of a farm should be because there's so many individual workloads now, so many different services, so many different things you can specialize your SharePoint environment in that you might need a topology very specific to that. Uh, let's say, for example, you have robust search needs. You need to search 10 million items plus. You might want to build a search environment that allows th that to happen, which requires multiple index servers, multiple query servers, etc. If you have um, a global managed metadata service, you might want to scale that specifically for that. That all has um, specific ramifications on SQL. Because if you look here, what's happened is now we can use SQL and scale that out as necessary to meet our needs, removing bottlenecks we used to have in SQL. These services I keep talking about are a la carte. You don't need to turn them all on. You can pick and choose what you want. If you don't have reasons to have access service, don't install or don't use the access service. If you don't have reasons for search, don't run search. Uh, it's great that you get to pick and choose what you want. And there's this new flex, uh, uh, flexibility around federation where I can have one server environment consuming certain services, maybe even providing certain services, and another server environment consuming those services, providing its own services. And some of these services are, um, uh, allows a geographic consumption. So for instance, I can say manage metadata, I can have a, a farm that's centralized, uh, which all farms that I have in my, my large scale environment will consume. This is great, but it has specific ramifications for SQL. Because in SQL, we really need to be building SQL to take this into consideration. And this is a list of all the different new things and this is probably a beta list. There's probably even more stuff going on now. So with those services, I remember I said service application builders have the right to create one or more databases as part of their application. They need to store state. The database stores the state. What we have here in black is what 2007 had around databases. What we have in red is what 2010 introduces. This is if you turn on all the different service applications. When you turn on those service applications, this is just those application databases. This has nothing to do with the content. We still have the same content paradigm where you create one or more databases for storing sites. You can see why this is a problem now. If I count these up, I'd show you there's 19 databases here with one content. So 18 databases just for service apps and config. How many folks use database mirroring or are familiar with it? All right, I love you guys. Um, as you're probably aware, database mirroring had certain limits to the number of databases you could mirror. At one point, that limit used to be the guidance from the SQL Cat team was 10. <laughs> right away, you can see some problems with that uh, guidance and, and our new uh, paradigm here in 2010. Fortunately, um, We'll talk about here in a minute why we don't have to listen to 10 databases per SQL instance. I just learned this the other day. This is really, really cool. Microsoft just came out with their new capacity boundaries guidance. 
It's a gigantic Word document that says everything that the website used to say and so much more. And it looks like somebody actually did some diligence around publishing that information. Um, what it included was some surprises to me. Content DB size. We always said in 2007 you should limit it to 100 gigabytes. Some of us ignored that. And we had to build SQL up to, to accommodate that. What they're saying now is that the limit's 200 gigs. I don't know if they've actually changed anything to make that work any better. The schema is different. The schema is better, not good enough to allow storage of 200 gigs. What might have happened is Microsoft said, you know, we have enough people that have large databases and we haven't seen performance issues from them. Um, that shouldn't be a big deal. File size is the same. There's a hard limit, uh, what they call a, a boundary in their paper. Um, you cannot store more than two gigabytes of content uh, in, in one file. And that's just a hard limit because the column in SQL that stores that information, the image column, is restricted to a two gigabyte limit. Nor do I, do I think you would actually want to go through the process of uploading two gigabytes to SharePoint, trying to prevent the timeouts and stuff from happening. Even in an API, this, this gets difficult. Um, so that guidance remains in fact. Um, RBS has interesting implications because if we use RBS, we're no longer restricted by that. And we'll talk about RBS in a minute. Databases per web application. The guidance used to be 100 databases, and Microsoft certainly flirted with that limit. We'd have 100, 200, 300. Uh, in 2003, we had, uh, I think, at one point, 900 databases on one farm. And we ran into scalability issues, big time. And that was across like five instances of SQL. What they decided is that now we'll allow 300 databases. God forbid. Anybody actually need 300 content databases on one web? That's pretty extreme. Site collection size is the same. So they're still saying, and this is just guidance, not, this isn't a boundary. It's not like you hit 100 gigabytes and you can't grow your site collection anymore. They're saying that bad things happen once you exceed the 100 gigabyte threshold. What are those bad things? Generally just site performance issues, random slowness. Um, I rather think it has a lot more to do with the structure of your site collection, the number of webs, the number of objects in your site collection more than actual content size. I can put five documents that each equal you know, a total of 100 gigabytes of content. I'm not going to see any performance issues at all in my site collection rather than, other than when I try to render that content that's so gigantic. Um, it's not going to affect my site collection in any way. However, what they're trying to say is that folks that usually exceed this 100 gigabyte limit also do other things that cause problems, like they create gigantic lists. They create lots of webs underneath the site collection. And these things have performance ramifications. List items per view. SharePoint can't store more than 2,000 items. Have you heard that? Not true. It's basically saying you can't store more than 2,000 items or, or can't render more than one view. And it's not like you can't render them. It just Bad things happen. You get performance issues. It takes a long time to render that much content. Microsoft's up the guidance now to 5,000. And they actually have controls and stuff, which we'll talk about in a minute, that uh, allow you to, to enforce that. Remote blob storage. So for you folks that uh, didn't know what I was talking about, I was talking about Royal Bank of Scotland. I was talking about remote blob storage, uh, sometimes called external blob storage. It's essentially a way to take the blob now, what a blob is, it's just content, random content that SQL, unstructured content, SQL knows nothing of. SQL has list, essentially, right? And they have tables. The tables have columns. A blob sits inside a column neatly, yet it looks nothing like the usual plain text data you interface with when you're querying SQL. We call that a blob. And it refers to all the documents. It refers to uh, all the pages that get... Uh, um, uh, unghosted or customized, whatever Microsoft's using these days for terminology. Um, all this stuff gets stored in SQL. The problem with that approach is that SQL itself is not really designed. We, we, we already have one boundary, right? Two gigabytes is the limit of, of the size of a file I can store in SharePoint, and that's not very conducive to my new, new, new age media, things like my YouTube videos and stuff like that I need to store. Um, that becomes a problem, right? Also, um, SQL, SQL doesn't render that content as fast as, say, like rendering off a file share. 
SQL has overhead associated with pulling that data into memory and then rendering it to you uh, on the front end. And that takes time and effort. Things that SQL would probably be better off doing other stuff. And so enter the remote blob storage. Now, if anybody has built a five terabyte SQL instance plus knows that SQL can get very, very expensive very, very fast if you do it right. I've built many, many instances that had 200 spindles of storage underneath them. And if you're doing that on, I won't name any vendor names, but there's some vendors that are extremely expensive. And if you're doing it with RAID 10 storage, uh, their proper I.O. and stuff, it gets very, very, very expensive. Remote blob storage was created specifically for that reason. And not for you. Microsoft didn't care about you at that time with this problem. Microsoft cared about its Office Live team. Office Live folks were creating uh, puny, what I call puny SQL instances. They didn't, really, they didn't have a, a, a SKU that allowed them to scale past one terabyte. In fact, I think it was 640 gigabytes uh, per SQL instance. So imagine creating all these different SQL instances to support Office Live storage needs. It gets very, very expensive. You got all this very, very expensive storage associated with SQL. What they wanted was a way to get all that data and it's a good 90, 95% of what you store in SQL is this blob data. They wanted that out of SQL into something that was much, much cheaper, uh, something like RAID 5 file, file share storage. And that's essentially what they did. So Microsoft in 2007 released this capability uh, as part of Service Pack 1, I believe, which allowed folks to externalize this content using an API. What Microsoft's done in 2010 is they've updated this API. They always said their guidance was in 2007 always, you shouldn't leverage this. Don't use this. Don't, don't, don't play with it because we're going to change it. Well, they did change it. I don't know if they've upgraded anything um, or changed how the API works, but as a vendor, um, we weren't really interested in looking at 2007 for external storage because of this change. And you shouldn't have been either. I don't know what the upgrade path will look like. In 2010, we're still limited to an API. There is no default out-of-the-box functionality for storing this content. But wait, I heard that you know, 2010 had RBS. No, not really. What Microsoft did was create you know, a new API, which is a little bit friendlier to, to build on and use, and they have lots of vendors who can come in and help you store this stuff externally for free or for cost, mostly for cost, and um, <laughs> with the exception of an upgrade scenario. If you have um, Express edition of SQL and you need to upgrade from 2007 to 2010, and you have site collections larger than four gigabytes, which is the limit for Express instance, they leverage the RBS um, um, provider automatically to uh, upgrade that environment so that you don't have to be subject to that restriction. You need a provider, so I've, I've used the word provider a lot. What a provider means is basically an interface, if you will, between um, SharePoint and the mechanism you're storing that blob in. Um, and it's dependent upon the storage medium. If you're using a file share, you need a SIFS provider. If you're using a um, NetApp or one of these you know, crazy vendors with the crazy file storage schemes, then that requires its own provider. Everybody has their own provider. You need your provider. There's a lot of vendors now who are releasing their free providers. You can leverage those if you want. I really, I haven't tested any. I can't tell you whether or not they're good or bad. What I will tell you is that it could be risky. Putting this stuff outside of SQL means that SQL and SharePoint no longer control it. They no longer own it. And I'll go on my diatribe now where I say this is a very, very risky proposition. Because once you externalize that content out of SQL, you're now giving folks, especially in the case of a file share, just think what I can do with a file share. Go to the file share. Render the file share. Look at this crazy folder called external blob storage. Try to get into it. I can't get into it. Oh, right click, take control. OK, take control. Change all the access permissions on it automatically. Go in and delete some content. Everything in SharePoint was just lost. You can't get that SharePoint content back. 
There's no, the SharePoint backup mechanism doesn't protect that content. You need some other method of protection. There's a lot of issues, difficulties associated with storing stuff out of the box. So with that, make sure your vendor solution, your provider solution, takes all that stuff into account. There is one free provider uh, that is available out of the box uh, provided by SQL, the SQL file stream um, in 2008. Gives you the capability to leverage this out of the box. There's already been some guidance published. I don't have links here, uh, but if you search around, you'll find this very, very quickly. Um, guidance on how to leverage the out of the box SQL provider. Bottom line, it's risky though. Make sure you understand all the ramifications of leveraging this feature. Database mirroring. So, a lot of folks in here were familiar with database mirroring, and that's great. I've done my job because I was a huge proponent of this um, way back when, um, when everybody told me I was crazy, that nobody needed this, and it was too difficult and couldn't be implemented in SharePoint. It can now be implemented in SharePoint and much, much better. Database mirroring is essentially a hot standby or warm standby and or cold standby capability to a separate SQL instance. I like to look at database mirroring as a replacement for very expensive shared storage and clustering. If you have a SAN, it's very expensive, right? You have that SAN because you need a cluster. That cluster allows the shared storage and all that to work, you know, fell over between the two instances. That instance of storage is a single point of failure. Now, you're, if you spent $500,000, $400,000 on that storage, it's going to be very hard to take that storage down because it's very, very redundant. That said, it's still just one disk with the data. You can use RAID and things like that to, to fix that. There have been um, some bad cases, cases I was uh, um, involved in at Microsoft where we lost lots of data because of SAN issues. You plug the wrong disk into the wrong SAN and things go bad really quick. And you can initialize, zero initialize, and format a SAN very quickly. Keep that stuff in mind. Database mirroring is a way to uh, limit your risk associated with that because you can have redundant sets of data. I can now say I have a sequences over here, sequences over here, they have independent storage, and I can mirror the data between the two. 2007 support was absolute rubbish. I worked very, very hard to figure out a way to implement 2007, uh, or database mirroring with 2007, and the best thing we could come up with was the stuff called aliasing. Now, aliasing was essentially a way to abstract the name, if you will, of the SQL instance, to trick SharePoint into thinking it's talking to a server called server A, when in fact it was talking to a server called server 1. And then when you need to fail over between server 1 and server 2, you said server A points to server 2. That's all well and good, except you need to update that stuff manually or have very, very complex scripts and stuff to make all that work. It's difficult. 2010 was done right from the start. Ever since 2005 and when database mirroring was implemented uh, by the SQL Server team, they had the right way to do it. And the right way to do it was to address the, uh, your, your SQL uh, connections uh, with a failover partner. So the SQL connection said, I want to go talk to SQL 1. However, SQL 1, um, if SQL 1 is unavailable, after a default timeout period of 10 seconds, Go talk to server two. You put that in your database connection string. When we talked to the Microsoft product team in 2007 about allowing us to do this, they said, we don't know where all our SQL connections are. Therefore, we can't update all these things to support this parameter. Since 2010 was such a radical redesign from the platform standpoint, they are able to support this property now. So what that means is that if you use database mirroring on your back end and configure your partner your other SQL instance um, with uh, redundant data, redundant databases on each side, SharePoint will automatically fell over this, um, this content, this connection uh, for you. So you don't have to do all that crazy scripting and stuff. It works with uh, SQL 2005 or 2008 and with a witness server um, or without. A witness server is basically a way to make SQL automatically fell over. You can learn more tomorrow at my session. I got SharePoint Iron Man presentation tomorrow at 10. I think it's still the time. And uh, we'll go into depth about that. So, 
Microsoft also provided, with SharePoint 2010, some out-of-the-box tools to make your life as an administrator, as an architect, easier. One of those tools is the Health Analyzer. The Health Analyzer is a best practices analysis uh, capability built right into the farm. Essentially what it is, it's just a big list. A timer job, that timer infrastructure is great, and Microsoft leverages it on, you know, very well on its own. Um, will, a timer job will run and check various configuration items in your farm. It'll look for things like, um, are there mismatching alternate access mappings? Uh, is Excel services configured? Things like this. And it's like, okay, check this, check this, check this. When it does that, it writes these items, these best practice violations, to a list. This list you can then view through central administration. There is one really cool capability, is that there's some automatic fix capabilities. So for things like database defragmentation, which is a very, very critical, important part of running a scalable service, the health analyzer will automatically fix that for you. Let's take a look at it. I can get my mouse over here. Well, that was speedy. Right. So here's Central Administration 2010. And right away, the very first thing you see if you get past all the eye candy is this big red banner here that says, SharePoint Health Analyzer has detected some critical issues that require your attention. You click on that. And I should have warmed this up prior. This thing takes a long time to render sometimes. Um, what we'll be presented with is a big list in central administration, grouped by uh, things like availability, like supportability, like um, um, performance. Oh, here we go. Perfect. And insecurity. And what it's showing me is that there are issues in this farm. Well, there should be issues because this is out-of-the-box configuration. And it's not even a good one. This was done on a whim. I think I did this for a, a class uh, on building out a SharePoint farm. So if we click on any one of these issues, up pops this really awesome dialogue that tells me why this is an issue. It shows me the severity, the category, an explanation of the issue, how to remedy this problem, and where these problems lie. These are all based on rules that can be extended. And I think uh, um, Chris Whitehead, who's doing a presentation later this week, either not today or tomorrow, is doing a, 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 uh, some, some content on extending this capability. There is one really cool one here. Where are you? Let me go back into the... Let me go view rule settings. Where is this at? Health rules. All this stuff is just list. So here's all the different rules available as of this build. Don't know if Microsoft's adding any more for RTM. But you can see various things. The one I want to point out is this one here. Databases used by SharePoint have fragmented indices. It's saying that if you have fragmentation in your index in the SharePoint, and by default you will, if you have a collaboration environment, you'll have 100% fragmentation within a week, guaranteed. These things fragment very, very fast. And when you fragment an index, it becomes very hard for SQL to respond to your needs. SharePoint 2010 will automatically repair this stuff for you, which is really, really great. Now, there's, just, there's very, very few of these rules that actually have the automatic repair, but that was a great candidate for, for one of those. So what that's telling you is that in SharePoint 2010, you no longer have to worry about building database maintenance jobs that update these things, that fix these things for you. The SharePoint will take care of that for you, which is great. Oop, I almost hit the bad button. Request throttling. So what request throttling is to me is a high availability feature. And essentially what it allows is if my server becomes burdened, if it surpasses certain thresholds, KPIs that are very, very important to ensuring the proper performance and availability of my service, I can configure SharePoint 
to send users a 503 message if they're trying to initiate any new um, gets or search requests. So anything new, any type of new request uh, that meets those criteria, get or search, will be rejected and the user will be sent 503. Sounds very bad. Sounds like an unavailability feature, right? Well, what it does is it allows that folks that use SharePoint who already have existing requests, it allows those requests to remain responsive if configured properly. So it's actually a high availability feature. This en enables you uh, to continue to do your work on your servers and folks that had work to do will need to be rejected and come back later. Now you can customize your 503 error messages, they're just IIS messages, customize those to, um, to tell users exactly what's going on and why it's an issue and uh, hopefully minimize your help desk request because of that. So there are adjustable KPIs. Uh, out of the box, I believe you get uh, ASP.NET requests queued, which is a very, very important web server uh, performance threshold. And I forget the other ones, either memory utilization or process utilization. Um, you can add to this list. I could, for example, say SQL is extremely important to render my performance. And I should bring in SQL thresholds, SQL KPIs that are important uh, to ensuring good availability. So it allows you to do that. Let's take a look at it. Just going to show you the GUI versions because we don't have a lot of time. Is there no breadcrumbs? In Here we go. There's my breadcrumb. Right. So I click on web app, uh, manage web applications and I'm going to highlight a web application and now we have a contextual ribbon in SharePoint 2010, which is great. We like the ribbon paradigm, right? If we go to general settings, click on resource throttling, we see a world of new stuff going on here that didn't exist in 2007. The relevant portion of this is right down here. HTTP request monitoring and throttling, on or off. This is a per web application setting. There's no global server setting for this. You can't change it on a global basis. Uh, the best you could do is script this in PowerShell or something like that, and change it across the board. On or off here. Now, if you use PowerShell, you go into the nitty gritty, you can actually start playing with this and look at things uh, like the various KPIs and how those KPIs uh, affect this rendering. I think the default, something about, there, there's something about 5,000 server uh, requests. And once you hit 5,000 requests, this, this capability uh, kicks in. It's so tempting to hit that bad button. Right. So we also have large list throttling. Why is this relevant to a SQL discussion? Because it's these large lists that affect SQL performance so badly. Uh, when I was at Microsoft, we had a year-long project to figure out why SharePoint sucked. Not from an end user's you know, you know, functionality standpoint, but why was the performance of our hosted farm so bad? And it's so bad that users spent um, minutes just getting a, a home page to their site. That's very, very bad performance and uh, unacceptable for most of Microsoft. So we spent a long, long time investigating uh, some of the things we found out was that SQL is very, very critical to performance and large list cause problems. Large list affects a performance uh, of not only to the large list user, but to every uh, database, uh, content, every bit of site collection, every user of a farm can be affected by one big list. What Microsoft decided to do was build some controls around how people can leverage list. So what large list throttling is, is essentially a way to prevent users from making really big queries. And when a user exceeds a query, that user will get an error message. And that error message is, is uh, not so obvious. Um, uh, we'll see it here in a minute. Let's just take a look at it. So 
Sorry, this, this server's in, uh, in uh, Seattle, so performance isn't that great across the wire. So what we see, a list view threshold. What this is telling me is that my end users shall not make queries that involve more than 5,000 items. It also allows me, which is interesting why this is put here, um, the ability for developers to override these settings. Do I want my developers to have the capability to render more content? Maybe I should because they are building things in a scalable way and they've done it in a scalable way. It doesn't affect my system performance. And we've tested it and vetted it and everything's fine. No problem. Should site collection administrators and auditors have an ability to query more? By default, yes. You'll be allowed to query up to 20,000 items and because, um, because you're smarter, I guess. I think what it really means is that there's fewer of you than your, than your other users, and therefore you can do less damage, right? You can change the list view threshold, lookup threshold. So how many lookup columns can I put in a single list, and should that be affected by this setting? So if I, if I have a, a list that involves more than eight by default, uh, I'll get the same error message telling me, go away, come back later. Speaking of which, I have a whiteout period. I can say, well, because nothing's going on between 7 p.m. and 7 a.m. in the morning, I'll allow folks to run batch jobs and things like that to involve this list. Um, never mind the backups and stuff going on that are going to affect that. Everybody knows unique permissions are bad, right? You have a way to control that as well and how that might affect your, uh, impact your server performance. So there's a lot of different buttons here where you control uh, how these large lists render. Let me see if I still have my demo up. I hadn't looked at this environment in a long, long time. What I'm going to attempt to do is show you how this stuff in action. Maybe. Hasn't been warmed up. Time check. So it is now 1516. We started at what? 2.30? Right. So we have 15 minutes? Hmm. OK. We got a lot more content to get through. Just know that this stuff works. Um, it works in sometimes, at least in beta, in, in random, capability, random ways, but um, there is this capability, and hopefully in RTM, which will be uh, coming out very, very, very soon, um, we'll, uh, we'll have the uh, robust capabilities to control this. So going back to presentation. Yep. We have this really cool thing called a developer dashboard now. And what this developer dashboard is, it's essentially a component I can land in any SharePoint page and spy on how that page, how those page components affect my overall system. I can see, uh, any, anybody use HTTP Fiddler? Yeah, I love that thing. Uh, Fiddler is great. It shows you all the different uh, requests and stuff from the client side going into uh, that, that make up rendering something like default ASPX. This is essentially a similar deal, except it's done from a server side. And you get a lot more rich data about what's going on. I can see all the individual components that make up a page. I can see how long they take to render. I can see what database queries were involved in doing that, how long those took to render, and overall things like that. And I can extend this capability really cool. So it's enabled per farm. You turn it on or off or on demand, which on demand should be the default setting. Um, and what that means is that, uh, well, let me show you. You see this really cool thing over here? I have my server configured to be on demand. And what that means is that I'm presented with this beautiful icon that only I know about because I know something about this over here on the very extreme upper right-hand corner. If I click on this, what it's going to do is insert the developer dashboard into my page at the bottom. Because this page doesn't actually do much, it's not as interesting as, some, say, your customized portal page. But look at all this cool stuff that's going on here. I see a Fiddler-like um, um, 
list over here that shows all the different requests going on to render this page, how long they took. I see some web server information, some critical events and, and uh, stuff associated with rendering this single page, and relevant to our discussion here, database queries. Why is this important? I just come off a performance engagement. The performance engagement uh, was, why is our site randomly slow? Why does it sometimes take 14 seconds to render our site? Just a home page. This was a 2007 environment. I wish I had the developer dashboard, because it would have made my troubleshooting so much, much easier. What we found out was that these users were using a portal site map provider. And the portal site map provider uh, was uh, uh, building navigation based on a very, very, very deep site collection. A site collection that had 1,458 webs underneath. It didn't scale so well. Not at all, in fact. And what we did was I had to build some similar functionality using SQL Query Analyzer uh, to find out this information. And I built a similar list here. It's that I was doing counts of queries. And what I learned was that uh, to render a single page, default ASPX involved um, 90,000 queries. One page, 90,000 queries. Not good, right? This gives you this out-of-the-box capability to just see this stuff. This is a great thing to enable in your pre-production, your test environments, your de development environments, and look, spy at the internals, and prevent very, very bad customizations from affecting your environment. Again, you have extensible KPIs, so I have no clue how to do it. Somebody like Eric Schupps can tell you um, how to extend this thing. Um, but you can add additional metadata to the dashboard. So it's really cool. We have this new capability called Sandbox Solutions. How many have heard of Sandbox Solutions? No, oh, good. Um, sandbox Solutions, new in SharePoint Foundation and above. Um, give you the ability to control um, the render of customizations in your environment. It's no different than any other SharePoint solution, except that the sandbox solutions are built in a new way, have certain restrictions that prevent them from affecting your environment. Um, uh oh, next bullet point is gone. Maybe it'll come up in a minute. It'll probably go zooming past to the next slide. But anyways, so these um, sandbox solutions allow you to control the rendering of customizations on a quota basis. So just like we have a site collection quota, well, used to, used to be we had a site collection quota, and that meant one thing, storage, right? How much storage is allocated to this site? Well, now we have an additional parameter called points. How many points are allocated to this site? These points, um, 300 by default, um, essentially say they're an abstract way to, to understand how a customization of impacts your server environment. That's just a long way to say um, points equal server resources in, in, in various ways, and that you have the ability to control how many points are allocated to each site collection. So by default, you get 300. And Sure, why that's not working. There we go. The relevant por portion of this to SQL is that I can also see and restrict how many queries a solution will do and how much query time is involved in, in those queries themselves. So I can control those two um, very important parameters and say that, uh, let's say that. Uh, 10 milliseconds of query time and above equal one point against my system. And it's kind of like points on your license. I guess you got that in the UK, right? You know, point system on your license, you get like 12 points and you're out kind of thing. Don't drive anymore, right? It's a similar thing here. Once you exceed your quota, that site collection can no longer render not only that customization, but all sandbox customizations in that site collection. And this brings up an interesting problem I, I venture to guess that it might be possible to brand your site collection using a sandbox solution and exceed your quota because of some bad code, and then suddenly your branding disappeared, which might be interesting. 
Because if you're in this situation, now you, you know, that's certainly going to generate a help desk request, right? That's stuff to think about. But there's really cool capabilities to control this stuff. Here are points. Here is the metadata associated with um, points. I got this from PowerShell, uh, one of the commandlets. We'll get this information. You format in a table, and it spits out all this really, really cool stuff. SharePoint database query count. Resources per point, 400. I believe that means um, 400 queries equal one point. This is how you control it. You can modify these things. I could change that to 500 or 100. Database query time, uh, 0.1, 20. So 20, I believe, is 20 milliseconds. So if it takes more longer than 20 milliseconds to render this query, assign them a point. So that's pretty cool. SQL resource governor. How are we doing on time? We've got about six minutes left. We should be wrapping up. We're not. We're going to keep going. SQL resource governor. I call this the nuclear option. This is the big red button you push as a panic button to control how your SQL environment's use. This is a 2008 feature only. What this allows you to do is control at a very granular level what connections, how those connections affect your SQL Server system. And it comes on a, a per memory and per processor basis. It's very, very cool because for anything, any way I can identify a connection as unique, I can say that that connection should be restricted in some way. So if I can identify a connection by a user, let's say your, um, your managed metadata service is running uh, as uh, my domain slash managed metadata service. If it's running under that name, you can restrict that connection being called under that account to use no more than 25% of your CPU, use no more than 500 megabytes of memory. It's a really cool capability. Going back to the sandbox solution scenario, we, have a, um, we can turn on sandbox solutions on specific web servers. And because that web server will make a call that makes it unique for that web server to SQL, I can restrict that connection from that web server to assign it a certain allocation of SQL server resources. This becomes really cool because now I can create very, very advanced topologies for rendering customizations. It's enabled per SQL instance, and it works on a per connection basis. So I turn it on at the SQL Server level, and then I can control my individual connections. This is a very dangerous thing to do. <laughs> because it works so well, um, what you don't want to do is turn this on willy-nilly. I have a great uh, example on my blog where it does make sense. How many of you folks like to query SharePoint databases and information stuff? You do that because you have a job to do, right? You've got to get information. Information is power. Um, sometimes we... Most of us aren't SQL experts, uh, and we make bad queries. A really good thing to do is maybe enable this for your administrators. You can say, anybody that meets the administrator group should not have the capability to leverage more than 25% CPU. So when they create those bad SQL queries that end up in infinite loops, you can restrict how that affects your system. And this is very, very important for a multi-administrator uh, environment, a high-scale environment where you have lots of folks affecting a system. This could really be a big benefit. It was at Microsoft. One important note is this only kicks in when thresholds are exceeded. So only when, say, 80% memory utilization has occurred and 80% CPU utilization has occurred will these thresholds kick in. Will you see governance at this level? Right. So that's all the new features for SharePoint 2010, which is great because we're running out of time. However, I do want to underscore this entire conversation by saying all the best practices for SQL Server, all the best practices for storage, all that stuff that makes SQL and storage scale for an environment are still very, very relevant in 2010, more relevant than they ever were before because of all this new stuff, all these new service applications, all these new touch points, it becomes very, very important to configure SQL and your storage to meet the needs of this new demand. All these old SQL best practices still make sense. I should still configure my memory properly. I should configure my temp database properly. I won't go into the specifics of these, but I should certainly plan my storage appropriately. Storage becomes, is the biggest bottleneck in any SQL Server system. 
There's a, a good analogy made by a very, very smart friend of mine um, who said that uh, uh, the processor is uh, instantly fast, memory is an order of magnitude slower, um, well, cache is an order of magnitude slower than processor, memory is an order of magnitude slower than cache, and storage is two orders of magnitude slower than memory. Now, that might be changing with SSDs and things like that, but it becomes very, very important to optimize this very, very critical bottleneck. And so you want to do things like dedicate storage for SQL. This is just no-brainer, right? If you've got a critical environment running SharePoint, we should have storage that isn't being used by Exchange. We should have storage that isn't being used by insert custom application here. I can't tell you how many times I've talked to folks who said we have random performance issues come to find out they had random applications accessing the exact same storage as SharePoint was home, though. It's very, very important, just from a good understanding, to have dedicated storage. This just will clear up so many issues uh, in your environment. Use RAID 10. You can get away with using RAID 5 for your content storage. Uh, however, RAID 5 is quite a bit slower for writing content than, uh, than RAID 10, and RAID 10 becomes... Uh, uh, very important. This is more important than ever. Your front ends, your SKUs, your web servers, they don't look much different than your SQL servers anymore. It used to be back 10 years ago when you implemented a web server, a web server had like one gig of RAM and maybe one processor. And that one processor had like 1.6 gigahertz of capability, right? Now you implement a web server SKU that has dual quad cores and 16 gigs of RAM. And your SQL server has dual quad cores and 16 gigs of RAM or 32 gigs of RAM because you can, really can't buy anything smaller than that these days. This becomes a problem because this guidance was written, this is 2007 based guidance that said at eight servers, eight servers to one SQL backend, you hit a plateau. What it really suggested was that three web servers can take a SQL server. There's no additional capacity gain by adding more web servers if you don't add additional back-end capacity. What's happened now since 2007 is that we have, this, this scenario has gotten much, much worse. It's much, much more important to balance this capability. So make sure you build out beefy, beefy SQL instances to handle those very aggressive web servers and application servers. Yep, yep. Okay. SQL needs disk I.O. It's extremely important that you have proper disk I.O. And Microsoft has already come up with best practices around how that I.O. should be allocated. And it says that you have certain temp disks that are dedicated to rendering temp content. You have log disks that are dedicated to rendering log content. You have, well, we have search here. Search used to be very, very important. Maybe you have search, um, let's say you have application-specific uh, data arrays that are they're, they're designed to support the various needs of that application itself. And this has changed a whole lot because in addition to search, we now have all these different service applications going on which might have even more needs around, around um, storage. And then finally, we have our data. And data ends up being one of the least important from a performance standpoint. So think disk I.O., not disk capacity. Right. So in summary, let me get all these up here. We have specific requirements. We can only use SQL Server 2005 and above, right? We have more SQL touch points. But we have better flexibility now in SharePoint 2010. We have better availability. We have better tools for changing how SharePoint affects and monitoring how SharePoint affects my backend. The bottom line is SQL is more important than ever. Make sure you treat it well. Make sure you configure it by best practices and you allocate the hardware it needs to do its job. Again, you can locate me at these various places. This deck will be available on the Evo site and on my blog. And we don't have time for a Q&A, but feel free to come up and talk to me as I get off the stage. Thanks, everybody. Have a good day. <laughs>